Eschatology, Lesson 3, The Mystery of the Church, Its Inclusion and Conclusion, Part 1. Amen. So we have learned that God reveals Himself and works His will through dispensations. The study of end times really focuses on three dispensations, and we covered all of the dispensations last week, so you can go back and review that if you'd like. But the, the study of end times really focuses on three of those dispensations. Law, gra- church grace, we said that's, that's one because they're together, and the millennial reign. That's the three the end times focuses on. So the law, because without the law, you don't understand what's right and wrong. Without the church and the grace of God, that's kind of this side of the cross, which is a blessing and helps us, especially as Gentiles, helps us being grafted into the body of Christ, into the kingdom of God. And the millennial reign, which is also to come. So let us look closer at the church age to see how it ties into Daniel's 70 weeks. The dispensation of mystery. Theologians refer to the church age as the dispensation of grace or the dispensation of mystery. We are currently in this dispensation. This is where we're currently at. So it is referred to as the dispensation of grace because God reveals himself to us and deals with us through grace. Now, we can see here that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, John 1, 17. For some churches, they will take the dispensation of grace or the doctrine of grace, and they don't stay rooted and grounded in the things of God as far as what the Word says about grace. They try to pervert it and go left field with it to say that you can do anything that you want to do, and God will cover it in grace. God will cover everything in grace that you can just live how you want to, sin how you want to. You don't have to change if you don't want to because God's grace covers everything. Well, we understand if you study the word out, if you study what grace is really about, it is to cover our lack of being able to be perfect. But that doesn't mean that we are not supposed to strive to perfect our holiness is what another what the Word tells us to do. Another verse that we can think of that says that. We're perfecting holiness. That means to mature in holiness, to perfect it, to do as much as we can on our part to be holy, clean, and allow God's grace to make up the gap. Now, if, if you're building a bridge across a big canyon and you only build one foot of it, and so let's say it's, a hundred, let's say it's just 100 foot. Well, we'll just shorten it down for simple math. It's common core anymore. You can't do good math. So let's just narrow it down to small math. So if you've got a 100-foot gap that you're trying to cross and you only build a foot of a bridge to cross that 100 feet, you can't expect God's grace to fill up the rest of the 99. We're to do all that we can with everything, with God's help, of course, in everything that we say and do, all that we do, every, every, every part of that building, every bolt that we put into that bridge, every timber or metal, whatever you're putting down, whatever you're making that out of, every element that you're putting into that bridge, you say, Father, I need your help putting this. Help me to put this bolt in right. Help me to put the nut on right so everything stays together. Help me to do this. And we're seeking God's grace to help us to do everything that we can. And then where we still fall short, then we say, Father, I really need your help. I really need you to help me either jump this, (laughs) what's left of it, or Father, help fill in that gap so that I can, make, I can finish this bridge to get to the other side. And so maybe narrowing that down to really what I'm talking about, because sometimes we can talk vaguely and you can pick up what I'm laying down, some, but sometimes we can say those things and maybe in my mind it makes sense, but maybe it's coming across as, what, what, how, how exactly do we apply that, Pastor? Well, if your life is, say, if your sinful nature is over here and your and the kingdom of heaven, we we'll say God is over here heaven, and you're trying to bridge that gap to make it to heaven, so to leave your old nature, to leave your sinful life, to make it to heaven, not just being born again, making it to heaven, then what we do is we first we build that first foot of bridge by being born again, by turning to Jesus as our Savior. And so it's required of us to do everything that we can, being sanctified, laying off everything to consecrate, to consecrate ourselves, and to be holy and clean, and to build that bridge as much as we can, relying on God's help. When he says, hey, lay this down, yes, sir. That's us building that bridge because we're laying aside 
a weight. We're laying aside a sin. We're laying aside something that's keeping us from reaching the other side. So we continue to build that bridge. And maybe by the end of our life where we're maybe falling short because all fall short of the glory of God because all have sinned. So we maybe still like a little bit of gap, but we do everything that we can to get there. And we say, Father, I need your help to finish this last little bit. Father, finish, help me because I've run my race. I've kept the faith. I've done everything that you required of me. Help me to maybe make up this last little bit that I'm need of because I'm not perfect, Lord. You're my God. You're my, Jesus is my Savior. You're my Lord and Master. You've led me. You've guided me. I just need your help. And that's what helps fill in that gap. So might be, a, you know, maybe a simple illustration, however you want to say it. But for us, when we see the dispensation of grace, we're not talking about making up 99 feet of whatever just to make it across to heaven. We're talking about the dispensation of grace because not only is God giving us, given us his grace to help us where we have need of, but he's also given us grace as Gentiles to engraft us into the body of Christ and graft us into the kingdom of God. So, but yet it's also called the dispensation of mystery because we don't know what's about to happen. We can study it out, but here's the key thing of why it's really called the dispensation of mystery because we don't know where the church age is going, things of that nature, but the mystery is because these things were hidden from Old Testament people. They can maybe have a glimpse of God's going to speak to the Gentiles. God's going, to, God's going to do this. God's going to do that. God's going to give signs to the Gentiles. Okay, well, maybe it's a sign while he's setting up the, the kingdom here on earth for us Jews. It was still a mystery unto them that, that Gentiles would be grafted in in that regard. So we are currently in this dispensation it is referred to as the dispensation of grace because God reveals himself to us and deals with us through grace. That grace is also him not giving us, as we should probably say that's mercy, him not giving us what we deserve even though we do deserve it. His grace is his unmerited favor, his love towards us, his expression of helping us in our time of need when we're crying out unto him. But really unless you cry out to him, He's not going to give you grace because you got to humble yourself. Somebody that says, well, I can live however I want to because of grace, that's pride and arrogance, thinking it's all about you. And the Bible tells us very plainly that he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. The humble person says, God, I need you. I'm nothing without you. I need you, God. You're, the, you're what makes me any bit of good that I am. It's all because of you, Father. So I need you. I need your grace. I need your help. So under the dispensation of law, God revealed himself and dealt with mankind through the Mosaic law. So we understand that. Dispensation of law, Mosaic law, okay. But this is also the foundation of how people began to know what's right and what's wrong. It was written down for them to understand. Even for us today, we can go back and look at the law and say, okay, you don't prostitute your daughters, okay, you don't sleep with a neighbor's wife, okay? You don't lie, you don't steal, you don't kill, you don't cheat, you don't do this, don't do that, don't bear false witness. you got all these things that we're to know what's right and what's wrong. So we can go back to the Word of God, understand that, but also on this side, now the dispensation of grace and mystery, we have the Holy Spirit residing in us that He can help that Word come alive unto us. Now it's not just written down as a law, it's now within us and the Holy Spirit guides us. We could probably all think of a situation where we said, you know what, I was going to do this, but I just don't feel like that's right. I don't feel like I need to do that. And then maybe you study, you study the Word and you're doing a study on something, all of a sudden you run across a verse that could have applied to what you were about to do, but you had something on the inside that said, no, nah, I don't think I need to do this. That's the Holy Spirit. That's God's grace helping us if we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, the leading of the Holy Spirit, we can understand to be led by that, to stay away from even evil or sin or things of that nature just by being led by the Spirit. And then we can understand what the law says. We can understand what the Word says and have the backing of that to prove the Holy Spirit is accurate. Amen. The Holy Spirit's always going to be accurate whether we want to admit it or not. <laughs> but if we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we can follow that and be led by that, not even knowing. Even, I think of times as me as a Baptist boy, that you know, I grew up kind of following this feeling in my 
inner man, but I didn't quite know it was the leading of the Holy Spirit. But I could say, I don't know, it's just something doesn't feel right. Something doesn't, I don't know, I just don't have a good feeling about that. And that's all I could contribute it to. Because I didn't understand the working of the Holy Spirit. I knew the Holy Spirit existed, but I didn't know like on the inside of me, like on my inner man, my spirit man, was like, no, don't do that. Stay away from that. Don't do that. Even, you know, growing up, I was, in, I was in high school and stuff, I would watch horror movies. And so the Holy Spirit, one of the things that the leading of the Holy Spirit was like, as I started progressing in my walk with God, was like, you need to get rid of that stuff. You need to get rid of that stuff. And as I began to get rid of those things, there were verses that would come through maybe somebody ministering or me studying, don't entertain darkness. Don't partake in this. Don't partake in that. Stay away from these things. And I was like, oh, well, praise God. This makes so much more sense now. This is why we, I need to lay this. This is why I felt convicted over these things. Because we may not always have the word in front of us before we cross a bridge that we need to say, I don't need to partake in this. I don't need to cross this bridge. I don't need to stay in this lane that's going to get me into trouble. We may not fully understand it, but we've got to have our faith and trust in God and by the Holy Spirit. And that should really prompt us to study the word out for that subject. But many times we'll say, well, but nobody said anything, or I don't think of a verse right now that means it says I can't do that, so people go ahead and cross the bridge. That is not a good way to live. We need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit to say, all right, there's a warning flag, so let me pause. Let me not go any further. Let me study the word. Let me go to God. Let me pray about it. Let me talk to my pastor. Let me whatever to, to research this before I cross this bridge. Amen. So Daniel's 70 weeks, equaling 490 years, have not come to pass because the church was inserted after Jesus was crucified. Messiah shall be cut off, Daniel 9.26, and Daniel's last week was put on hold. Now we discussed this a little bit last week as well. The church and its reign were a mystery hidden from all but God. The church and its reign were a mystery hidden from all but God. So Ephesians 3, 4, 3, 9, excuse me. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which is from the beginning of the world, hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So we're going to read that verse again. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. So how else can you explain the fellowship of the mystery unless it's the fellowship of believers that are in the church age? Because remember... The Israelites, every time they would see, every time they would think of the Messiah, the coming Messiah, every time they would see Jesus and they would, they would keep asking him. You can see it all throughout the Gospels. When are you going to establish the kingdom, Jesus? When you, because they were thinking it's a natural kingdom that he's about to establish to overrun the government that's kind of persecuting them, overrunning them. He, they're thinking natural. <laughs> and we can't think natural when it comes to the things of God. Can we apply the natural to the spiritual things? Sometimes. It depends on the circumstance. But we should think more of spiritual things in regards to what God is wanting to do in our life. But you also find that when you think spiritual things and you're led by God, it's going to work itself out in the natural. Like for God to give us the spiritual command to win people to Christ. That's awesome. But how is that played out? In the natural, by you evangelizing, by you witnessing, by you being a living epistle, by you doing things in the natural that reflects the spiritual. But if you, but if we, we'll take the flip side of that, if somebody just lives a good, clean life, well, that's awesome. Proud of you. Awesome. Amen. But what, what testimony do you have for Christ? What testimony do you have for God? None. I've just lived a clean life. Because I've, I've known a handful of people that didn't cuss, didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't do all these other things. Why? Because they just wanted to be a good person. But it did not mean they had a walk with God. So when you focus on the natural, there can be no spiritual aspect to it. But when you focus on the spiritual, there's usually going to be something in the natural because it's going to be played out to be a, a witness or testimony for all. Amen. So the fellowship of the mystery is speaking of the church age. This is the age wherein 
We have fellowship with God, the Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the age wherein we have a fellowship with God, the Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ. We can only go to God through Jesus Christ. This opportunity and this dispensation were hidden from everyone from the beginning of the world. So again, we see it's hidden from everyone in the beginning of the world. So 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12 of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Notice the prophets have inquired, searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace, dispensation of grace, that should come. That means it's not there yet in their time when the prophets done this. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So if you have a mystery that's about to happen, then you have glory that should follow. So that should be key indicators for us in this dispensation. Unto whom it is revealed, it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things. Which are now reported unto you by them that have, been, that have preached the gospel Unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So this age is also called the dispensation of mystery because its existence was a mystery to the Old Testament believers and prophets. They could not see the church age coming. Not even the angels knew it was coming. So that's something to think about. Not even the angels in heaven knew that the church age was coming. So that tells you how important, how Highly, God thinks of all of us as Gentiles on this side of the cross that he would include us to even keep us hidden from the angels, keep us hidden from maybe the Old Testament saints, we could call them that, that he kept us hidden from them. That's that's kind of what we could say double fold. It's one, it's okay, because they didn't fully understand because as even the word tells us, we prophesy in part because we know in part. But with that also, that shows that there was a bigger picture that not all of them would understand. So if, if let's say if God were to reveal the whole picture to them in the Old Testament, then how much, would, how much time would they waste trying to see the whole picture that God gave them, trying to figure out every little nook and cranny, every little thing that would go with that, How much time would they waste instead of just saying, all right, God's given me this slice of the picture. This is my area. This is my lane. This is what I'm to write down. This is what I'm to proclaim. This is what I'm to fulfill. And however I can fit into the big puzzle of God, then praise God. It's going to stay in my lane and do my part. But sometimes if if we're not careful, we get wrapped up in trying to see everything, know, know everything, and we forget what we're supposed to be doing. Now, on the flip side of that, we can't only just see our portion because if you get focused on just on you, that can create pride, that can create arrogance, that can create a nobody else knows the gospel like I do, that can create a religious attitude. So we've got to keep this balance of staying focused on what God's given us, but knowing that we're also part of a bigger picture and we're one piece of the puzzle to keep ourselves humble, but we don't try to figure everything out that we forget what piece is ours. Amen. So in the Old Testament, angels often taught men. We can see that from Judges 13, 3 through 5, Daniel 9, 21 through 27, Daniel 10, 19 through 21, 11 and 12, Zechariah 1, 19 through 21, Zechariah 3, 6 through 10, Zechariah 4, 1 through 14. They are not able to do so in the New Testament hmm. due to their ignorance on the subject of salvation. This may also be a reason that this is kept a mystery because this is a subject they know nothing about. Angels cannot understand the subject of salvation. Angels cannot understand the subject of salvation. Why? Because they're meant to glorify God. They were used to teach in the Old Testament, used to teach men at times. But in the New Testament, there's a new covenant that God has established and they can't understand that. So in the church age, angels direct, they deliver, they serve, they smite, they comfort. So we can see they direct. We can see that from Acts 
They deliver, that's from Acts. They serve, Matthew and Hebrews. They smite. Hmm. Acts 12, 23, that's interesting. And they comfort. We can see that in Acts as well. So angels may not have a new directive. They have a new, maybe have a different route of the, what they're supposed to do. And that shows that if God re- kind of redirects the angels and what they're to do from the Old Testament to the New Testament, that shows how important we as the church are to God. That if he's willing to say, all right, you know, at this point in time, these dis- dispensations, you were to do this, now we're going to change gears. We're going to bring in the church age, and I need you to start doing this. So if he's directing them differently, that shows God means business in changing covenant with the church, the church age in this dispensation of the mystery. So however, during the tribulation, angels will be given the gospel to preach. Mm. During the tribulation. Notice it's not now, it's during the tribulation they'll be given the gospel to preach. Why? Probably because the, the rapture taking place is going to leave less witnesses. Now we know that there's other things that are going on during that time. But so God's going to start giving the angels charge to be able to give the gospel to preach to people. So that's really important to see. That's maybe another indication of why the, when the church is pulled out, now this 70th week is going to come to pass. And because the church is taken out, now if there's not that many people left to witness or people that have been serving God, God's going to say, all right, I need, I need the, the gospel to be preached, so I'm going to send my angels to do it. So that's something maybe to consider into, into the bigger picture. So Colossians 1, 25 through 27. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from the ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. So he says this is once hidden, but now it's being revealed. Revealed to who? The saints. His saints. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery of, among the Gentiles, which is, in, which, is, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we can see that God made known the riches of glory among this mystery among the Gentiles. So that means that we're part of that mystery. We were part of what was hidden. So praise God for it that we can say, at least we're in the kingdom of heaven. At least we're in the kingdom of God that we can do our part until we're raptured out of here. Amen. So which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this mystery of the church age revolves around the very fact that we not only get to fellowship with God, but he actually lives in us. We not only get to fellowship with him, he he lives in us. Now, this is a novel concept to those that were in the Old Testament because all they thought, all they focused on was the presence of God being with the Ten Commandments of the Ark Ark of the Covenant and following this natural thing to receive the presence of God. Now, we could also say with that mindset, that's the reason that the spirit of religion is so effective is because it tries to get us to follow something natural to bring the spiritual. And so it puts us in that mind because if we're not careful, we'll be just like the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the hypocrites, and the liars. So even in our teaching of the spirit of religiosity, the legalistic side, the legalistic ditch, falls right in line with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Why? Because they're focused on doing the natural to produce the spiritual. But when in reality, walking with God, spiritual, produces a better natural. Having a love and a relationship with God should produce a better lifestyle. But producing a better lifestyle does not, again, as we said at the beginning, does not mean or produce a walk with God. So again here, This mystery of the age, the church age revolves around the very fact that we not only get to fellowship with God, but he actually lives in us. So this is something that maybe they didn't even think about in the Old Testament. But here it is. It was a mystery hidden from all of them. 
But now here in the church age, we get to understand it even with Paul, who was a devout Jew who had a lot of bragging rights, so to speak, could see this, have this revelation from Jesus Christ himself, have these revelations throughout time, be able to write epistles unto us as as the church age and help us understand what God is doing in this dispensation. So the church age is made unique by the indwelling of God and his believers. No previous age or generation could see the church age coming. How could one begin to imagine the eternal God could possibly indwell a human being? How could the eternal God, the the God of all creation, indwell in a human being? But it all started with the firstborn of our kingdom of brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. Because that's what makes us joint heirs. It's because he was the firstborn to have the Holy Spirit, the presence of God within him, be fully man but fully God at the same time. That's the reason we call him the firstborn of that, that realm, which makes us joint heirs, which we know that we're grafted in. We are brought in. We're joint heirs with him in that regard. So we're blessed. But even in being our example, Jesus, he's our example in every realm that we could think of. Having the first, being the first person to have God dwell in him, but yet be a human being. Being our living example of how we're to treat our neighbor, how we're to love one another, how we're to lay down our life for one another, how we're to overcome the enemy, how we're to do all of these things throughout the, the New Testament that he gave us the example for and that people would write doctrine based on the Holy Spirit giving them the inspiration and refer to Jesus as being that example so many times of having the mind of Christ. You know, having warfare, praying like Jesus, all these other things that are referred back to his example for us. So you can imagine how hard it would be for the Israelites to maybe comprehend and even believe maybe at first of seeing Jesus and thinking, well, this guy is committing blasphemy because how can the holy God be in a man? But yet they were given prophecies of this would come to pass. So it's one of those things to where maybe it was hard to believe at first, but that, that requires, even for us, if we maybe hear a doctrine that we're not familiar with, and I don't know about that, we'll study it out. We have the Word of God. Study it out. Seek the Lord on it. Pray about it. Talk to your pastor. If your pastor is the one preaching it, study it out. Take it. Ask to, ask to speak about it in private. Work it out. So that way we can back it up with Scripture. So... Again, a person's doctrine is not going to be 100% accurate, but the Bible you can't argue with. The Bible is 100% accurate. Amen. So Acts 1, verse 6, 6 through 7. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of, to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So here we are seeing them ask, Are you going to restore again the kingdom of Israel? In other words, are you going to build up the city? Are you going to build up the kingdom, the government of Israel, that we can have our place once again? And of course, Jesus thinking spiritual and not natural, says it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. (laughs) Which the Father... Notice he says the Father, not himself, which the Father hath put in his own power. Even the apostles on the day of Jesus' ascension knew nothing about the church age. So even his right-hand men has been serving him for years. They're They're even asking him. It was still a mystery. They were looking for the millennial reign to start then. That's what they were looking for. They're looking for the millennial reign. They're looking for the, the government of God to be established. There are still times and seasons we are not able to know because the Father has put them into his, in, in his own power. So in other words, you're not going to be able to see everything of the big, big picture. <laughs> We're not going to fully comprehend and understand it. So we do our best to see it and to fulfill our part in it. But the things we don't know, we can try to study, but it's not meant for us to figure out every little detail. That's why you have so many people with different timelines of eschatology, last things, and all these 
different things that haven't happened yet. you got so many people that would differ on it. At the end of the day, serve Jesus and walk with him. Whatever happens is, is according to the word of God, not just speculation. Whatever happens according to the word of God is going to happen. It's best for us to catch the rapture on the way out of here so we can be with God. The quicker, the better. <laughs> Amen. So the times of the Gentiles. Jesus introduced a peculiar, peculiar term to his Jewish followers in the temple discourse, the time of the Gentiles. Luke 21, 24 says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into, into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time the kairos of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So imagine being a Jewish follower of Jesus of Nazareth, believing he is the Messiah that has come to redeem and deliver Israel, establishing an everlasting kingdom in Israel, only to hear him speak of the Gentiles trampling underfoot the holy city, and not just once, but for a whole season of time. <laughs> so we can see that this may have had an issue to cause offense, cause like, well, what are we doing? Well, why, why am I believing in you? Why, am I, why are we doing this? What's, what's, what are you talking about, Jesus? Because if you can see that you believe, if, well, come back to this paragraph, a Jewish follower believing that he's the Messiah, he's the coming anointed one, that he's sent to redeem and deliver Israel, who's going to establish an everlasting kingdom in Israel. But yet, when, you, when he's asked, he talks about the time of the Gentiles, the Gentiles trampling underfoot the holy city, which we know happens. It happened after, after Jesus' death and resurrection. And not once, but for a season, the Gentiles overran them. So Kairos, time indicated, indicates an appointed measure of time. We are living in that appointed time of the Gentiles. In another place, Jesus did hint at salvation being extended to the Gentiles, something the Jews would have found an anathema or something they didn't like or they loathed because they didn't like Gentiles. <laughs> so really, they don't like us. But those that are seeking Jesus as the Messiah, those that believe in him, they welcome us because they know it's exactly what he said. Amen. So John 10, 16 says, the, the other sheep I have, mm, the other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Jesus even declared it before all of the people. There's other sheep that I have. You don't know who they are. They're not of this fold. And they're not like you. We can say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. He welcomed us in. He welcomed us Gentiles in. He said, them I also, or them also, I must bring. He didn't say I might bring. He said I must bring. Why? Because if you've got your faith and trust in Jesus, he's going to bring you. If you're living for him and, and setting your faith on him and in him, he's going to bring you. You got to know him and he knows you. And it says, and they shall hear my voice. That's important for us to hear the voice of the Lord, not just calling us to salvation, but for him to be our Lord and master, for us to obey him, to keep his commandments, showing that we love him. But they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold. So he's going to bring together. Now we've had a series talking about Jesus, the great separator. But here we can also see that Jesus is the great <laughs> bringer togetherer. That's why Sparta would say it. The one that would bring people together. The one that would help people that believe in him, that have, that have committed their lives unto him to bring them together in unity. Which is why we also talk about the spirit of unity. When you have the spirit of unity, it means you don't really care about you know, putting your preference above anybody else, putting your preference above other things. You just want to be unified in Christ. You just want to be unified in the things of God to say, Father, we're just here for you. 
I may like it this way, but Lord, at the end of the day, I don't care about that. I'd rather for you to be glorified and you to be honored, for you to be pleased, than for me to receive anything I, I like or don't like or whatever. <laughs> so Jesus knew what he was doing. He knew about the church age. He knew all nations must be given the chance to receive his salvation. He knew all nations, not just the ones he liked, not just the ones that the Jews liked. All nations must be given the chance to receive his salvation. So Matthew 12, 21, it's also, well, we're about to get to it. And, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Matthew 12, 21. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Here's Acts 1, 8, which is our theme verse for the year, evangelism. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, they like Jerusalem, and all Judea, they like Judea, and in Samaria, the places they don't like, and unto the uttermost part of the earth and everywhere else. He says the places you do like, the places you don't like, and everywhere that's unknown to you. So that's the power of of this covenant that God wants to have with each and every one of us in this dispensation. Isaiah even prophesied as much. Oh, so now we're going to the Old Testament. So he prophesied it, but it was still a mystery unto them. So let's see what he has to say. Isaiah eleven ten, 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which we know is Jesus, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. What did Jesus say? He says, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden and wearied, I will give you rest. And it says, and his rest shall be glorious. Praise God. But notice, and to it shall the Gentiles seek. Notice this doesn't say that they'll be engrafted in, that there, there'll be a great revival among the Gentiles. It just says they're going to seek him. So even still, you could say, well, see, he prophesied it, but it's still a mystery because he doesn't understand the bigger picture of everything. That's, because just because you seek something doesn't mean you really want it. You can look for it, but many too often people will seek for something. When they find it, they're like, I found it. Now all the thrill's gone. Now I find something else to go look after. But when we find Jesus, when we find a relationship with God, we're to grab a hold of it and to keep it. The Isaiah 42 1 says, And he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. So they're probably thinking in their mind, Oh, he's going to bring judgment to them. They deserve it. I mean, I'm kind of putting words in his mouth in that regard, but, but for. For their mind, they're thinking Gentiles. That's unbelievers. They don't believe in God. So he's going to bring judgment to everybody. He's going to bring judgment to the Gentiles. Not knowing that there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ for us as Gentiles that we can still be engrafted in to the kingdom of God. There's still going to be a judgment for everybody, but we can be on the right side of judgment to be with Jesus. Amen. Isaiah 56, 8, The Lord God, which gathereth the outcasts, the eunuchs and foreigners, in verses 3 through 7 of Israel, Saith, yet will I gather others to him beside those who are gathered unto him. Hmm. So now we're getting maybe a little bit deeper into that revelation. But it's still yet a mystery unto them. Yet I will gather others to him. Others. What did Jesus say? I have a other sheep that's not of this fold. He's going to bring them together. Amen. For all the foretelling and prophecy, the engrafting of the Gentiles was still a mystery to be revealed. Ephesians 1, 9 through 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So the mystery of his will that he might gather together in one all things. So Daniel 9, 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. The church has been injected here between Messiah being cut off and the prince of the world destroying the temple. And the people of the prince 
shall come that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So even Daniel's core prophecy could not see the church age. So this is because God only was dealing, God was only dealing with him about thy people and thy holy city. So in other words, we could see that Daniel stayed in his lane. He wasn't focused on everything that even was inspired by the Holy Spirit for him to write down. He was focused on, what's my part in this, God? What's my part in this? So I'm going to read that again. This is because God was only dealing with him about thy people and thy holy city. It's one of the things that that made Daniel part of the beginning of the wise men to look for the star was because they said, "This this is our lane, this is what we're going to focus on, and we're just going to stay in our lane. So that's what we should do as Christians is stay in our lane. You know, especially for churches and ministries, if you try to get too big for your britches, so to speak, then you try to you start stretching yourself out and you're going to wear everybody out and you're not going to accomplish even the strength of what you would have if you had just stayed focused on what God wants you to do. That's why we don't do all these other certain things that maybe other churches do in our region or however because we want to just stay focused on our lane because we shouldn't get jealous or be mindful of, oh, well, this church is doing it and they're growing. Maybe we should do that. No, no, no. I don't care about that. I just want to stay focused on what, what has God told us to do? Because <laughs> if you start doing things out of jealousy, you start doing things out of pride and arrogance, trying to gather people and do things, then you're no different than a pagan church or a lukewarm church because now you're not focusing on the will of God. You're focusing on just gathering people. So, We've got to be like Daniel. And Daniel was counted as a wise man. Daniel was counted as one who even a pagan king would bring him in to say, you've got wisdom on your life, let's bring it in and use it. And not only was it Daniel, but it was some of his buddies that we've discussed from Daniel as well. So Daniel 9.26 jumps from Jesus' crucifixion to the Antichrist reign and skips over 2,000 plus years of the church age. So God's time clocks. When the church was born on the day of Pentecost, Jewish time stopped. Now, I like this next part. It says, and the dispensation of grace began. Pentecost was a Jewish holiday celebrating the feast of harvest. So Pentecost means the harvest has come. It's a celebration of that. It was celebrated annually. So every year from Exodus 20 through Acts 1, approximately 1,400 years. However, the annual celebration of Pentecost that occurred in Acts 2 is deemed as the, as the time Pentecost was fully come. Pentecost was fulfilled. The harvest has been fulfilled. Why? Because the, the, last, the dispensation before the church age has been fulfilled, and now the, on the day of the birth of the church age, then the dispensation of the mystery, you have This is exactly the way it's worded. Pentecost was fully come. It was fulfilled. Now a new dispensation takes place for the church age. So the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on those early believers was the fulfilling of the feast. That was the fulfillment of of the previous dispensation and starting the new one was the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. This was the last event on the Jewish clock before time stopped At the end of the 69th week, the church was born and church time began. Jewish time was put on hold. So we can see there's a lot to back this up. So when the church was taken out of the, when when the church is taken out of the earth in the rapture, Jewish time will resume and Daniel's last week of time, seven years, will play out. So we can see that when the church is taken out, because that will be the end of the church age, And Jewish time is going to resume. And so we can see that mystery. That's why it's part of that mystery is because it's inserted. It's unknown to everybody before it. And all of a sudden it's taken out and things continue. So there's a lot to see here. A lot to fully grasp and understand. So that period of time is also called Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30 verse 7. Alas, we are not Jacob. 
We are not Jacob. We are the church, and we will not be here. Praise God. Amen.